You ready to fan the flame? Again, everybody enthusiastically replied, yes. <laughs> so this morning, the question is, this is a few days after Valentine's Day, but it's still, love is it, love is it, every moment and every day. But are you ready to be the world's greatest lover? Yes! yes. <laughs> then you might say, what kind of a question is that? <laughs> okay, what kind of a question is that for a, a spiritual center, a church? Oh, I was thinking the same thing. I know, but I'm here, Kevin, to tell you why. <laughs> because it's not the kind of lover that you might have been oh. thinking about, okay? It's rather a lover of humankind, mm -hmm. which basically the readings have reflected, the meditation actually reflected, and of course, the music always comes from the love of Stephen. Mm. So a person can make a difference in the world through love, through love, through giving. A person can find <coughs> genuine happiness and contentment through love. That's the kind of lover that we are going to be speaking about today. Ernest Holmes, the founder of religious science, which is, this is a religious science new thought, spiritual center, was asked towards the end of his life if he had any, if he would do it over again, and especially in his, his book, uh, Science of Mind, which is the text upon which all the teachings are based, would he do anything differently? And he, he said yes. His answer was yes. He would do one thing differently. He would have changed something. He would have focused less on the law and more on love. Mm -hmm. Because in science of mind, it's all love and law. Love is the directive, law simply reacts. So to support that, he had, he had written two really powerful statements in his book. The first one is, love is the greatest <coughs> healing and drawing power on the earth. It is the very reason for our being. The other statement was, love is at the root of our nature. Our being requires love. We cannot exist without it. Love is the central theme to all spiritual paths. So you'll know that, that love is in all spiritual and religious teachings. God is love. That is, that's right there. But really, what is love? So I found a couple of statements from the mouths of children, because I, I really think the children are pure expressions of love. It hasn't been really tampered with too much yet, so they're, they're pretty honest with their love. So I have a couple of um, ideas that they had. The, one little boy said, when my grandmother got arthritis and could no longer paint her toenails, my grandfather does it for her, even though he has arthritis in his hands as well. That's love. And another little girl said, I know my oldest sister loves me because she gives me all of her old clothes. And <laughs> goes out and buys new ones. <laughs> love is when you smile even when you're tired. And you like this one. Love is when the puppy licks your face even though you leave him alone all day. <laughs> you know, that's, un that's unconditional love. Pets are pets. Mm -hmm really show unconditional love. They're pure, they are pure creations of love as we yes. are. And there are two different kinds of love, our love and God's love, but God makes them both. It's from children, ages four to eight. And we'll, we'll talk, I have a few more things from children throughout the talk, but I'm going to suggest that they are the same kind of love, that the, the human love and God's love are the same kind of love. So this morning, the question then really is, are you ready to meet life with a greater sense of love? Are you ready to experience a deeper, more profound love in your life? If so, I have four ideas to share with you. I always have a couple of things to share. Because this is, again, a practical spirituality. So we have four things to share. The first one is recognizing that God loves you. God loves you just the way you are. Absolutely. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> White Carol Mayo's in the front row. <laughs> Ernest, Holmes, Ernest Holmes wrote, Spirit is conscious of love as it is conscious of life. It is inspired by love and its government is one of love. And in Children's Letter to God, we have one child that wrote, Dear God, I bet it is very hard for you to love everybody in the whole world. There are only four people in my family, and I'm really having a lot of trouble <laughs> loving all of them. <laughs> We're talking about here unconditional love, the essence of love that is within each and every one of us. And so I have a little story about lightning bolts. Because it goes right with love, right? So what is the deal with lightning bugs? Here is a rather ordinary flying insect. But wait, it has a glow in the dark rear end. Lights up. <laughs> what was God thinking when it created? What's the purpose for? Science surely has all kinds of, of reasons why these bugs exist. I mean, they, they, they light up for their, for their mating and all kinds of things like that. But what if when God was creating all the other animals around us, it came up with the idea of a lightning bug simply because it would, it knew, it knew, God knew that kids would love it. We know, right? We know that God loves us. We know this. You should know this. This is number one. This is the first idea. God loves us. Okay. <clears throat> God loves us enough to create things we need to survive. So, could it be that he created something for us to enjoy? We enjoy lightning bugs. I do. I love lightning bugs. How many people like lightning bugs? Oh, yeah. Okay, see, I don't know many people that say no. I'm not like But we get so busy surrounding ourselves with man-made goods that we don't notice the living tapestry of life that God has created for us to enjoy. It's there for us to enjoy. When do we stop and notice it? Perhaps lightning bugs do have a purpose after all. They are a reminder of a creative God who loves us so much that he even made bugs whose rear end lights up just to see us smile. Because you got to smile when you see a lightning bug. Oh, look, there's a lightning bug. I mean, really, right? It's true. It's true. God really does love us. And, and in our practitioner, we have practitioner training class, H.P. Uh, Jeffrey, we're in the middle of his book right now, and the principle of healing, right? The scripture says that God is all and in all, and that God is love. God is omnipresent, God is omnipotent, and God is love. God knows himself. And since God is love, God knows himself as love. God knows himself in man as love. So sometimes, sometimes we don't really connect with that love, but it's present, it's present in each and every one of us. Sometimes we have it hidden up, sometimes it's filtered and covered, and you know, needs to just to be polished up a little, but it's there. That is the essence of each and every one, it is what we are created out of. Now the second idea this morning is to tell the truth about yourself, so that you can feel love. A lot of, a lot of these ideas also came through the real love books of Greg Bauer, uh, Greg Bear. So, you all lot, Reverend Jessica's not here, but we, we had the opportunity to see him three times actually, at um, workshops in Arizona last year, and we just took every single one that he offered because it's just amazing. But it's about love. Children were asked the question, "What do most people do on on their first date?" So on the first date, one child replied, they each tell each other lies. <laughs> <laughs> and that usually, that usually gets them the second date. <laughs> 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 I haven't gone on a date. 
<laughs> we do more than that on our first dates. We do a lot so that people will love us. But then the love doesn't feel real. Because we're not being real in the first place. Telling the truth about yourself is a critical component of the practice of real love, which as I said is Greg Bear's you know, series. It's a critical practice and it's the key to experiencing real unconditional love. Telling the truth about yourself, which can be challenging, means telling another person of your mistakes, your faults, your flaws, your fears, etc. You don't do this to dwell in the negative or to wallow in self-pity, but rather so that another person can see and accept you and love you just as you are, just as you are, what you really are. So always have, always have people around you, friends, relatives, if, if, if you're lucky enough, that you can tell the truth to. And they're going to love you. They're going to love you so much. They're going to give you that love just for you being you. Now, from a children's description of love again, yeah, a few, I don't usually talk about children, but we have a whole, we have a wonderful classroom full of them down the hall. When you tell someone something bad about yourself and you're scared, this is from a child, you're scared they won't love you anymore, but then you get a surprise because not only do they love you, they love you even more. <coughs> so that's the second idea. The third idea this morning is refuse to stay in anger and to learn self-love. I always love to deepen in the self-love part. So, What is anger, really? What is anger? If you break it down to its most basic level, anger is a response to not feeling loved. That's what anger is. And we always begin, do we not? We always begin with self-love. Because how can you give away that which you don't own? You must love yourself first in order to love anyone else. And I want to suggest that the place to start is right inside, because you can't start anywhere else. We think sometimes that we can. But if, if we can make this person love us or this person love us, then we'll be okay. We'll feel the love. Remember, it's an inside job. Always from the inside out. Always from the inside out. If you have places within your heart where anger or even hatred for yourself resides, it is incumbent, it is incumbent upon you to let love, let love in. Let love replace this anger. Because what does anger do? It blocks. It blocks the flow. It blocks the flow from any good to get through. So you may be thinking, if they only knew how dark it was inside me, all this stuff that I have going on inside me, how many things I have done so wrong, how I've messed up, then they would never really love me. They would never love me. Okay? Wrong. Wrong. Wayne Dyer wrote a book, There is a Spiritual Solution to Every Problem. And in it he says, everything you have ever done for which you may carry around self-contempt is in the past. So don't spend any of today entertaining self-hate or anger. Remember the truth about hate. It is love only going in the wrong direction. So shift your gears, he writes, into reverse and begin moving your thoughts into the, the direction of love, into the direction of self-love. And this is also true for the times when we get angry with others. Maybe we felt that their actions were unkind or deceitful, and so we get really angry with that. Maybe they spoke some very unkind words to us, and that upset us, and it makes you angry. Well, that's okay. It's okay to feel the feelings, as long as you don't stay in it. That's the key. 
not to stay in it. And notice I said, don't not get angry. Didn't say that. That's just like saying, don't hurt when you smash your finger with a, with a hammer. You, you know, you've got to feel the feelings, otherwise they are being suppressed. They are being held down. Then if, if you have to, it's really important to feel this stuff. It really is, but that's where today's counsel may differ from other counsel. It's to feel the emotion. Otherwise, we, we do what we call in, in radical forgiveness, which we're also doing right now. We do a spiritual bypass. So we want to be, we are spiritual beings, having a human experience. So we need to honor the human experience. So be in the feelings, honor those feelings, but don't stay stuck in them. Move on from them. That's telling the truth about yourself. You are going to tell someone how, you're not going to tell someone how horrible or the other person was a jerk or anything like that. But you're going to tell them your story of how you feel on love. And what is going to happen is this is a person you trust. This is a person you can speak to. And you're going to feel the love. And once you feel that love, it's transformative. It will shift everything. It will shift everything. So that's why I say always have some people in your life that you know love you unconditionally, no matter what you're going to go tell them, because you want to be able to tell the truth about who you are and feel the emotions and feel the love so you can transform. And it's important also in the forgiveness work that we do is that we don't do it for the other person. We don't forgive. We don't love for the other person. We do it first for ourselves. Always for ourselves. Then we can give it away. Remember, you can't give away what you don't own. And Ernest Holmes writes, when our minds are filled with the thoughts of anger, hatred, and resentment, we are pouring into our body poisons in the making. <clears throat> but anger can be turned into love, and the very power that has been destroying can be made into healing. So the fourth, the fourth idea is be loving. Be loving. So we come to the awareness, the first idea that God loves us. And the second idea is we tell the truth about ourselves. And we get loved. We get loved here in the human form. We're already loved in the divine mind. We get loved in the human form. And then the third one is refuse to stay angry. Refuse to stay in that place of anger, of hurt, of resentment. Refuse. Move to that divine place within. Connect with it because it's there. It's there within each and every one of us. It is. It's there. So we simply be loving. Be loving, which is an easy and natural thing when we've done the first three. You do the first three. Then you move into the fourth idea. Princess Diana once said, I think the biggest disease the world suffers from this day and age is the disease of people feeling unloved. And I know that I can give love for a minute, for a half hour, for a day, for a month, but I can give. And I'm very happy to do that. And I want to do that. Why do we want to do that? Why do we want to give love? It's in our nature to do it, but why do we want to love? Because loving is a wonderful, wonderful thing. It can be a very, well, first of all, it's very high, high vibrational. And second of all, it's an exhilarating experience to be loving. And why is being loving so wonderful? Why does it make us feel so good? It's because we are connecting with our divine essence. We are expressing our God self when we are in that place of being and giving love. We are made in the image and the likeness of love itself. That's what we're made out of. That's the truth of who we are. So we were born, we were born to love, just like a baby. 
perfect example. They love. They just purely, purely love. They don't judge. They just love. We just got lost and confused along the way, maybe a little bit. Maybe we took a couple of little detours. But now we can get back on track. And embraced by the light, Betty Edie writes, our purpose on earth is to love. Nothing brings us back into the awareness of our divinity like the experience of loving. God is love. Each experience of loving brings us closer to our true nature, which is a nature of love. So I want to share a true story with you about a man who simply showed love. So it's a little story. It was a cold, bitter evening in Northern Virginia many, many years ago. And the old man's beard, there was an old man there, and his beard was glazed in winter's frost while he waited for a ride across the river. He was on foot. The wait seemed endless. This is a true story, by the way, if I didn't say that. His body became numb and still from the frigid north wind. He heard the faint sound of hoofs coming from the distance along the frozen path, and anxiously he watched as several horsemen rounded the bend. He let the first one pass, and then another came by, and he let that one pass too, and then one more came, and he let that one pass. But finally, the last horseman was, was pulling up, and the old man was now was looking like a snow statue. As this one drew near, the old man caught the rider's eye. And he said, Sir, would you man mind giving an old man a ride across the river to the other side? There doesn't appear to be a passageway. So reining his horse in, the rider replied, Sure thing, hop aboard. And he could see that the old man was all frozen and stiff and couldn't get really up on the horse, so he got off his, he dismounted. And he got off and he helped the old man up onto his horse. The horseman took the old man, not just across the river, but to his destination, which was a few miles away. As they neared the tiny cottage, the horseman's curiosity caused him to inquire, Sir, I noticed that you let several other riders pass you by without making any effort to get a ride from them. And then I came up and you immediately asked me for this ride. I was just curious why on such a cold, bitter night you would let the others pass by. And the old man lowered himself slowly down from the horse, looked the rider straight in the eyes and replied, I've been around these parts for a long time. I reckon I know people pretty good. I looked into the eyes of the other riders and I immediately knew there was no concern for my situation. It would have been useless even to have asked them for a ride, but when I looked into your eyes, kindness and compassion were evident. I knew then and there that you had the gentle spirit, which would welcome the opportunity to give me experience in my time of need. Those heartwarming comments touched the horseman deeply. And he said, I'm most grateful for what you have said to me. May I never get too busy in my own affairs that I fail to respond to the needs of others with kindness and compassion. And with that, Thomas Jefferson, the President of the United States, turned his horse around and rode back to the White House. Mm -hmm. True story. I don't know who wrote it, but it said true story. And I believe it. <laughs> so this morning, this morning then, are you ready? Are you really ready to move into that place of being the world's greatest lover? Because it's your choice. It's, your, it's always going to be your choice. And remember how much God loves you. Tell the truth about yourself. Tell the truth about yourself and get loved. Feel the love. And then refuse to get angry. And then be loved. Simply be loving. Simply be loving. Be that compassion. Love is real. 
It is an eternal creation, and nothing can destroy it. God, I love this, God is not the author of fear. There you go, Melissa. God is not the author of fear. The author of love. That's who God is. Remember this and you will be at peace. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, a 19th century French monk that I'm sure a lot of you might have heard of, and mystic said, the day will come after harnessing space, the winds, the tides, and gravitation. We shall harness for God the energies of love. And on that day, for the second time in the history of the world, we shall discover, we shall have discovered fire. So, I want to end this talk with, with this little poem that I found. I thought that you might enjoy it. So I thought, let me end it with this, because I like it. It's a prayer that you can remember. I'm proud to say, so far today, I've got along all right. I have not gossiped, whined, or bragged, or had a single fight. I haven't lost my temper once or criticized my mate. I have not lied, I have not cried, or loudly cursed my fate. So far today, I've not one time been grumpy or morose. I've not been spiteful, cold, or vain, self-centered or verbose. But Lord, I'm going to need your help throughout the hours ahead. So give me strength, dear Lord, for now I'm getting out of bed. <laughs> so let us set our intentions. I know, it takes a triple thing. Let us set our intentions truly to be great lovers. Let's be great lovers, and let's start with loving ourselves and then spread the love around. 